Colleagues, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for joining us once again for this uh, World Health Organization Africa Region online briefing in collaboration with uh, APO Group. It is um, a fortnightly briefing where we give you an update of the COVID-19 situation in Africa. I am Tipi Soma Buitla. Welcome. Um, the WHO briefing is being broadcast live in two languages, English and French. So please choose your language preference. That's on the, glo the globe icon there at the bottom of the Zoom app. So please, if you want it on English, choose that French, do it on that. Francois? Yes, hello, bonjour, et merci d'être uh, présent pour uh, ce point de presse. Vous pouvez choisir la langue dans laquelle vous souhaitez entendre la conférence en utilisant l'outil d'interprétation de Zoom, qui est le petit globe dans les options, et vous pouvez choisir euh, anglais ou français. Merci. OK, so colleagues, as usual, please remember to use the Q&A function on your Zoom app if you want to ask a question. I know some of you have already sent in questions. Please also indicate to whom you want to uh, pose the question to, whom you represent and also introduce yourself. So that is very, very important that you do that. So colleagues, as you know, Africa is not one country. It is a continent of disparate fortunes and challenges. And today we're going to look at the COVID-19 situations on the continent and case studies of two countries. We're looking at Rwanda and Niger. You'll hear from both countries what their experiences have been. So before we carry on with the briefing, let me please introduce the esteemed panel. Joining us from Brazzaville, Congo is Dr. Matsiri Sumwit, who's the WHO Regional Director for Africa, whom you know. She is joined by Dr. Michelle Yao, who's the Emergency Operations Manager at WHO Africa. He'll be on standby to answer questions. And... Um, and Nia May, let's say a warm welcome to the Honorable Dr. Edi Ilyasu Mainasara, who's Niger's Minister of Public Health, joining us uh, from Rwanda, the Honorable Dr. Daniel Ngamije, the Minister of Health. So let's get this off to a good start. To my panelists, please do keep to the time allotted to you, two, three minutes, so that we can have as many questions from uh, the press as possible. Dr. Mwerti, let's start with you. We know that uh, Africa was nearing that million mark. What is the status quo as we speak? Yes, uh, thank you very much. partner the APO in enabling this uh, conversation with journalists. Thank you everybody for joining us and uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased to welcome uh, Monsieur le Ministre de la Santé Publique de la République du Niger, Dr. Idi Ilya Soumaï Nassara. Soyez le bienvenu, Monsieur le Ministre, and uh, also the Honorable Minister of Health in Rwanda, Dr. Daniel Ngamije. Welcome, Minister. Today, we'd like to take stock of the persistent and emerging challenges in the COVID-19 response, as well as the solutions that we are seeing across the countries in the continent. And I'd like to commend the honorable ministers for the strong and dedicated action in your countries. You have encountered some challenges. We had a, a surge of cases in uh, Niger some time ago, and you were able to work on it and bring those, reduce the number. I'm sure both ministers will share more details with us of uh, some of the innovations and some of the approaches that they've taken. At a time when governments are easing lockdown measures, the realization is uh, dawning strongly that we will have to live with this virus for some time. There are now almost 1 million reported cases of COVID-19 in Africa, so we have not yet reached that uh, milestone and over 21,000 people have sadly lost their lives. South Africa remains the worst affected country on the continent and is now the fifth most affected country globally. In partnership with the Department of Health in South Africa, WHO is deploying more than 40 regional experts to provide support at the national and provincial levels in the country. Overall, the cases on the African continent account for 5% of the global total. And I'm often asked whether they reflect the true picture of the epidemic or not. 
one of the constant and concerning challenges in many African countries is a shortage of kits to test people for COVID-19. At the same time, some countries have increased their testing per capita while maintaining a low positivity rate, countries such as Mauritius, Rwanda, Cabo Verde, and Botswana. Through the UN supply portal, we are supporting countries to replenish test kits and other commodities. This area of access to new technologies, including also future vaccines and treatments, is one in which international solidarity remains absolutely vital. Through the COVAX platform, we are working with Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, and other partners with a strong emphasis on equity in access to these commodities. We are starting also to work with governments and national regulatory authorities to be ready to roll out when a vaccine becomes available. So this readiness is extremely important. Countries and communities are leading the way in advancing solutions to many of the challenges in this response. And we will hear some of the examples from uh, Nigeria, for example. The advocacy of community leaders encourage more people to seek testing. In Mauritania, university students are helping to ramp up surveillance. Kenya trained over 79,000 community health workers and 15,000 youth champions who have raised awareness among 17 million people through household visits and other activities. So from Benai to Zimbabwe, countries are integrating COVID-19 in polio geographic information systems to provide real-time information for decision-making. So far, WHO has helped to strengthen the skills of more than 70,000 health workers in collaboration with regional and national professional associations. And Cote d'Ivoire, for example, has cascaded training around to around 10,000 health workers in all of its 113 health districts. We are continuing to work with local authorities to expand public health capacities, including more than 30 countries that have decentralized lab or laboratory testing uh, capacities. As I said, countries are opening up borders and there are challenges in detecting and managing imported cases and sustaining the intensity of this, these public health measures as economic activities resume. Through our individual actions and choices, we as people all play a key role in solving these challenges. So in closing, I ask that you continue to join me in practicing and promoting the life-saving preventive actions. Wearing a mask and wearing it correctly so it actually covers your nose as well as your chin and mouth. Washing our hands frequently and keeping a distance. I recognize that African households need support beyond the health sector to be able to play their part, especially low-income households. So I appeal to governments and international partners to provide the support. Thank you. I look forward very much to our conversation today. Thank you very much, Dr. Mwedi. As you say, Africa at this moment account to for 5% of the global infections, but the worrying thing, as you say, is the lack of testing. Let's hear now how Niger has had to deal with the challenges facing it. I know there are multiple challenges there. So uh, Honorable Dr. Edi Ilyasu Mainasara is the Niger's Minister of Public Health. Please talk to us about the challenges that you've had, if you found any solutions thus far. Merci. Bonjour, Dr. Mewiti. En tout cas, c'est un honneur pour le Niger d'être présent à cette vidéoconférence. Merci. Les stratégies que le Niger a, a utilisées pour gérer cette pandémie, d'abord, il faut noter l'engagement politique, l'engagement politique au plus haut niveau et qui a permis la mise en place dès les premiers cas enregistrés en Afrique, en dehors du Niger, d'un comité interministériel d'orientation qui est présidé par le président de la République en personne. Et au-dessous de ce comité, il y a, mis en, il y a eu la mise en place d'un comité interministériel et de gestion qui est dirigé par le premier ministre et chef du gouvernement. Et à côté de ces deux grands comités, il y a eu des comités ou des cellules techniques d'appui. C'est entre autres la, le comité scientifique qui est dirigé par le recteur de l'Université de Niamey. 
et vous avez un autre comité qui est dirigé par euh, les religieux, le président de l'association, excusez-moi, le président de l'association islamique du Niger, le monseigneur Lampo, qui est représentant des églises et, du Niger, et tous les comités techniques auxquels est rattaché, sont rattachés plusieurs sous-commissions, sous-commission riposte, sous-commission prise en charge, sous-commission communication, etc., etc., c'est en son près de 15 comités de gestion qui ont été mis en place euh, au Niger. Après la mise en place de ce comité, il y a eu l'élaboration d'un plan de riposte euh, à la pandémie et la mise en place euh, de, 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 de <coughs> l'élaboration de ce plan de riposte. Après ce plan de riposte, il y a eu la réunion, la table ronde qui a regroupé tous les bailleurs de fonds et tous les partenaires euh, techniques, tout ce qui est système des Nations Unies, en particulier l'OMS et les autres organisations sous-régionales telles que l'OAS. Il y a eu l'appui financier dès le départ euh, de l'État et le financement, en tout cas, du plan de riposte par les partenaires euh, techniques et financiers. Il y a eu également une forte implication dans le suivi de la coordination de, de la mise en œuvre de ce plan de riposte. Il y a également la coordination multisectorielle et multidisciplinaire et une forte implication de tous les acteurs du système des Nations Unies et la mise en place d'une plateforme d'échange par vision conférence entre le gouvernement, le système des Nations Unies, les diplomates qui sont accrédités au, au Niger et d'autres personnes, euh, ressources qui ont en tout cas euh, partager leur expérience par rapport à la gestion des épidémies. Il y a eu la prise de décision d'orientation qui était basée sur euh, les avis techniques, comme euh, je vous l'ai dit. Et il y a un comité scientifique qui regroupe, qui regroupe d'éminentes personnalités. Il y a un comité euh, technique qui regroupe plusieurs acteurs, les ministres, euh, l'OMS, en tout cas tous les acteurs et dont on pense qu'ils peuvent apporter un plus par rapport à la gestion de cette pandémie, ont été impliqués. Et après cela, donc 39 mesures ont été prises par le gouvernement en vue de freiner et d'arrêter la propagation de cette maladie. Je ne vais pas les citer toutes, mais permettez-moi quand même euh, euh, de citer quelques-unes. C'est le cas de la fermeture des frontières, des écoles, des lieux de culte, L'état d'urgence qui a été déclaré actuellement, on vit en état d'urgence. Il y a le couvre-feu et il y a l'interdiction de tout rassemblement. Il y a les mesures de barrière, la protection de l'utilisation des bavettes, l'utilisation des, 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 en tout cas des, des moyens de protection individuelle, la distanciation sociale, etc. Il y a eu l'élaboration et la diffusion des mesures stratégiques au niveau des huit régions du Niger. Et on a également révisé la, la stratégie et qui consiste en tout cas à améliorer les alertes à la définition des cas, la mise en place d'un centre de gestion des alertes, le suivi physique électronique des, des contacts, le respect des mesures de lutte par le pôle d'administration, le système des Nations Unies qui ont en tout cas beaucoup contribué à la réduction des cas. Il y a eu également la mise en place d'un système de confinement rigoureux, des contacts, puis des voyageurs entrant des lieux spéciaux dédiés eh, par l'État. Il y a le test à l'arrivée et le test au 14e jour après le confinement, puisqu'on avait opté dès le départ pour un confinement de deux semaines pour tous ces lieux qui reviennent, en tout cas de la zone d'épidémie, ou tous ces lieux qui reviennent, en tout cas qui rentrent au Niger, les dispositions de confinement ont été prises. Il y a la mise en place euh, en collaboration avec euh, le, le système des Nations Unies et les stratégies du confinement obligatoire systématique au niveau des hôtels qui ont été dédiés, soit c'est des hôtels réquisitionnés par le gouvernement, mais il y a également des hôtels qui ont été lués par les... du privé dans la gestion de cette euh, épidémie et il faut surtout noter l'engouement 
vraiment de ces partenaires de proximité qui nous ont accompagnés. Il y a eu d'autres stratégies comme la production locale des, des, des bavettes qui sont destinées à l'usage de la population. Et c'est des bavettes qui ont été certifiées, en tout cas par le comité d'experts, surtout avec l'appui de, de, de l'OMS qui nous a aidé à étudier la, la qualité et la fiabilité de, de, de ces bavettes avant de, de, de demander à nos producteurs locaux de le produire. Nous avons élaboré et produit environ 7 millions de bavettes qu'on a mis gratuitement à la disposition de tous les élèves, en tout cas du de, 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 de secondaire jusqu'aux universités, qu'elles soient en tout cas les structures scolaires publiques ou privées, les enseignants, etc. Il y a eu eh, la distribution des bavettes et surtout les bavettes euh, médicales au niveau des structures de santé pour continuer, pour euh, assurer la continuité de ça parce qu'on s'était dit que cette maladie, il faut vivre avec et pour cette raison, il faut mettre à la disposition de tous les agents de santé les, les bavettes. Et nous mettons chaque mois plus de 1 million, 4, plus de et 1 million 400 000 bavettes pour protéger les agents de santé, pour leur permettre de continuer les activités de la route. Nous avons mis en place tout un paquet, en tout cas, de la gestion communautaire de cette pandémie. Apparemment, j'ai épuisé les trois minutes. I, I, think minutes. Have, I think you have, Dr. Maynard, so if you'll allow me to uh, just uh, thank you for that contribution, emphasizing the importance of... Of... Thank you, Dr. Oui. Maynard, sorry, and I assure you that there will be ample opportunity to expand a little bit more about that multi disciplinary approach that you have taken and uh, questions yes. have already uh, come through so that you can speak a little bit more about that. So thank you very much. Uh, let's hear a little bit more now from Rwanda's experience. You know, Rwanda has almost double uh, the positive cases of Niger, but very minuscule uh, deaths. Uh, Honorable Minister Ngamejie is uh, going to speak to us now how about how Rwanda has been handling the COVID-19 response that started very early, I think from January, isn't it, uh, Dr. Ngamiji? Uh, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm honored as well to be on this platform for sharing Rwanda experience. I will start by uh, saying thanks to Dr. Moeti, the regional director of WHO and colleagues who are on this web, uh, this video conference, as we share our experience. Uh, so basically, we had our first case, as you know, on 14th March 2020. And so far, we are with uh, 2,104 cases, conf confirmed cases, and uh, 1,237 were discharged. And we remain in our treatment centers with uh, 862 uh, patient in uh, different treatment centers in the country. So far, we reported five deaths. So as my colleague from Niger said, well, we, we set also similar structures for containing this uh, pandemic uh, from the national level up to the lowest level at uh, the district level. And we also developed a preparedness and response plan costing 73 million US dollars for the first six months. Uh, we are planning to revisit it again and extend it up to December. Uh, I want just to share some key uh, achievements that, uh, uh, in addition to what my colleague said. First, it's about the centralization of COVID-19 uh, response. We came to realize that uh, at the beginning, uh, our response was uh, driven by the central government, I mean, at the central level from the Ministry of Health. And it appears that we could not sustain that kind of intervening interventions uh, initiated from the central level. That's why we decided to decentralize COVID-19 response. And we did it by reinforcing structures uh, of COVID-19 response at the district level, making sure that uh, all these structures are effectively functioning, uh, we provided guidelines how they should function, and uh, 
we provide technical support, especially in increasing their capacity for testing COVID-19. We started with one national referral lab able to test COVID-19 in February 2020. Today we are with uh, 10 sites in the country where COVID-19 can be tested. We also uh, reinforce capacity for case management because we came to realize that uh, uh, with uh, community transmission which occurred in one district in uh, West province of this country, we could not rely on capacity from the central level people to go and uh, facilitate the treatment of people admitted in those treatment center. And then we strengthen the capacity of a clinician at uh, this treatment center to be able to manage COVID-19 uh, confirmed cases. Thinking that uh, it can happen in more than two or three districts, the conclusion was like we, we should start to test home-based management of COVID-19. Uh, and we are starting piloting the model to see whether this can be feasible in some settings, in some household, depending criteria that we set. And uh, once we check and we realize that uh, a setting or a household is meeting those criteria, we are testing uh, this possibility of treating uh, COVID-19 at home without necessarily picking the person to a treatment center. Because after six months of this pandemic in the country, uh, government is making a lot of expenditure and uh, it's a lot of pressure to the health system. We should be anticipating ahead what might happen if there is generalized community transmission. We should already thinking how to contain and manage uh, the case, a scenario of generalized community transmission if it's happened. Uh, what also we did is to optimize testing uh, processes. You know, the shortage of kits on the market. If we are doing like a community survey in environment where we have low incidence of COVID, we do a pool testing system so that uh, we consume less uh, uh, kits while getting results uh, quickly. And then we are able to take some decision to contain or to guide decisions uh, for containing COVID-19 pandemic. A second point of experience I want to share with, uh, with you is the use of technology uh, to guide our response. Of course, COVID-19 is transmitted through contact between a person who is infected and another one who is not yet infected. So trying to reduce all means that can reduce transmission uh, was the objective for us. And we came to realize that uh, transaction, financial transaction by exchanging money uh, was also one of the source of transmitting this disease. So the government encouraged uh, that uh, we use mobile money cashless uh, system by facilitating uh, operating, operating, money, uh, operating companies uh, of telecommunication to not charge those transactions, at least reducing the cost of transaction so that people can get advantage of not necessarily doing their transaction by exchanging uh, money, but they can do payment or transfer of money using technology. What also we did was to try to reduce the use of papers in different intervention we are doing. Like when we are doing tracing of cases, initially we used to fill some forms and those also could be a vector for transmission of, of the disease or just bring a lot of work. Then we went through a system of using iPad and mobile phone for collecting information, especially when we are doing our tracing, uh, tracing of, uh, of, of suspected or contact of people who are infected. 
So we can mm-hmm. use those. Uh, we have an app which can be used through those uh, iPad or, or a telephone, smartphone, even where there is no uh, connection. Yeah. Then later on, information can be stored and analyzed when a person is joining a place where there is connection. Dr. So Ngan- this, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm Please delaying. Stop. Okay, let me go quickly. So th- this was uh, very helpful, at least for investigation teams. And uh, we also use this technology to uh, reduce transmission of the disease among health personnel by using robots and other tools like drones for community awareness. Uh, Why using drones to, 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 for the transmission of different messages? And, uh, and also, uh, in our command posts, we were using data, visual, data visualization uh, system so that uh, it became more easy to see in different settings where you have a lot of increase of incidence of the disease. And it's more easy to explain it to decision makers and to the population where you are displaying a map of the country. And then you can show them that in this sector or in this village, you can see increase of cases just in a visual manner. It became more easy to understand and then to, to go for decision like for lockdown, etc. People will just feel why you are putting these villages in lockdown and keep the other ones without being in lockdown. I think for, for now, this is some experience that uh, I can share with you. For the rest, we can probably give additional information through questions. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngamiji. I think there's a lot of interesting things that came out of that, especially the home-based management system and how you are optimizing testing. I think a lot of us would like to hear more about that. But we already do have questions coming in from my colleagues. So uh, please allow me to have uh, the first question comes through from my colleague here in South Africa, Tamar Khan from Business Day. You've got some questions, if I could just uh, allow you to ask yours. Hi there, thanks very much. My question is to Dr. Moetti. Um, and firstly, I wondered if you could comment on why the WHO team is only going into South Africa now um, after it's recorded more than half a million cases. And there are some signs that infections are plateauing in some provinces. So it raises the question, would it not have been better to go in sooner and help prevent the virus take, uh, taking hold in the way it has? And secondly, um, in your view, um, what aspect of South Africa's response to the coronavirus pandemic requires the most urgent attention? Thank you. Thank you, Tama. Dr. Mwedu? Um, yes, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Well, first of all, I, I think uh, we have sent a team to South Africa, uh, of which uh, 15 people arrived uh, early this morning. But, you know, WHO has always been present in South Africa. We have a local team. We have uh, a WHO office, a leader, the WHO representative. And we had, in fact, mobilized quite a number of local experts. So we have our own staff. Our own staff uh, in our office were repurposed to work in support of the government and the country. And then we recruited additional experts. And, you know, at, at, at the certain point in time, it was not possible to move anybody anywhere. We had many staff stuck in on, on routes, on mission, people who were going to various places because of the very strict lockdowns that had been imposed by countries. And it is now as these lockdowns have started to be relaxed and as a situation in, in South Africa has started to, to become so serious that we have been able to um, mobilize and uh, to send this team into the country. Um, and as to which aspects of the response need strengthening, Well, certainly we've seen that there are several severely affected provinces in South Africa. One of the most important understandings we have is that there is need for better capacity at the local level, at the district level and in provinces. So what we are doing with uh, this team is that we will, with the Department of Health, be deploying them around several of the most severely affected provinces to support the management in areas such as um, epidemiology, surveillance, data analysis. Um, We we know that uh, one of the most important things is for the data to be, uh, first for the results to be available quickly in terms of laboratory testing, and then for the data to be analyzed quickly in order to guide action. 
We've also got people who are going in to support other areas like uh, risk communication, ensuring that they work with uh, local authorities, local experts, and our team from the country office to enable the communication with people to be decentralized, to be localized, to be through local organizations, associations, but to make sure that the core messaging is kept um, is kept accurate. At the provincial district level, we're going to support coordination. I think you've heard the way the, particularly the minister from Niger described, and it's similar in South Africa. There are many players who are involved in this work. And one of the key roles of the government, the provincial health leadership is to work with all of these and make sure that everybody is doing their part um, adequately as, so as to have the most impact. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Moiti. So um, interesting that you speak about decentralization. Wanda earlier on speaking about how centralization was very pivotal to its management. We've got a question here from Vincent Castano from KT Radio in Rwanda. Now his question is about how he feels many countries are not taking preventative measures seriously and how this is likely to affect their neighbors. So Dr. Gamiji, if I could ask you to answer this question, please. Yeah, for, for the decentralization, as, as I explained, uh, our first cases occurred in Kigali. Uh, and then the, the first cluster of cases were in Kigali. And later on, with uh, regional uh, cross-border transport, uh, we had cases out of Kigali, especially uh, in the west part of the country. So, uh, and as I said, the first community transmission we had occurred in a Rusizi district close to Bukavu city in, in DRC. It's far from Kigali, 300 kilometers from Kigali. So, uh, and then some sporadic cases appearing here and there. Uh, so basically decentralizing the response was, was for, uh, required uh, because we could not bring teams from the central level and go and intervene uh, in any district this was done at the beginning, but it was not sustainable. And we don't know when this disease will be, this pandemic will be uh, out of the country, even the world. So we are going to with solutions that are sustainable. And then for having those solutions, for having a solution which is sustainable, the centralization of the entire team, uh, I mean, the, the, the centralization of capacity to the district level was for us a key decision to, to strengthen teams where they are at the district level so that they can respond properly. Uh, this is what we did. For the second question, I didn't touch it well, if you could repeat it. So Dr. Ngamiji, very, very, very briefly. So do you think that your preventative measures have helped secure your neighbors? Y yes. Uh, I think I think we, we, I can say yes because uh, we we had different clusters appearing here and there, but uh, so far at least in Rwanda we can say that uh, the only community transmission we had was in in Rusizi and today uh, four sectors which initially were under lockdown are now uh, are not yet in are no longer in the lockdown. Uh, if you, you you analyze the trend of cases in that district, there is massive reduction of cases. And we try with different measures in place to contain uh, any arrival of imported cases. And even when people are traveling from Rwanda now, because we opened our airspace, we, we, we have strict measures to test them before traveling. So we are trying to avoid any new imported cases and we avoid also to export cases while we contain transmission of the disease in the country itself. Right. Thank you so much, Dr. Kamiji. We've got a, a similar question from James Amadou from Radio Television Niger. So this will be to Niger to answer. And the question here, Dr. Maina Sara, is basically about compliance and what is the strategy of the Niger government to deal with it? Dr. Maina, sorry, did you get that question? Proper like. 
No, repeat the question. Okay, so, so the question is about uh, compliance and what the Niger government is doing. What is the strategy to deal with this non-compliance? Euh, merci. Et effectivement, le gouvernement <coughs> s'est entouré de toutes les précautions pour que les 39 mesures et que nous avons prises avant même l'apparition la, du premier cas au Niger qui est survenu le 19 mars, <coughs> pris toutes les mesures et pour mettre en œuvre et ces, 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 ces mesures. Et la première grande mesure qui nous a permis d'appliquer les dispositions prises, c'est l'état d'urgence. Un état d'urgence, et si vous voulez, c'est presque une confiscation des libertés des individus, puisque c'est une situation de guerre, une situation de pandémie, c'est une situation de guerre. Et pour euh, faire appliquer les mesures, il faut qu'on soit dans une disposition particulière. Et c'est ce qui nous a amené même à l'Assemblée nationale devant les députés pour faire le plaidoyer, pour expliquer la nécessité d'une de, 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 loi et qui, qui sécurise les agents de santé qui font les traçages, qui font les dépistages, qui font les confinements et des, 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 des personnes contaminées, des personnes contact, des personnes qui rentrent au pays et contaminées. Et c'est ça qui nous a permis, en tout cas, de mettre en œuvre. Et pour vous assurer que... Et, dans la plupart des cas, ces mesures euh, ont été respectées. C'est vrai, il y a quelques le, que des, des failles qui ont été observées par-ci, par-là, mais on a pu rattraper par la suite. Et c'est ce qui nous a permis, en tout cas, de limiter de façon très significative la propagation de et cette euh, pandémie. Je, je, je vous informe que le premier cas qui a été enregistré, c'était un cas importé, ce n'est pas un cas autochtone. Quand je dis importé, c'est un expatrié qui est arrivé au Niger et, et chez qui, en tout cas, le, 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 le test a été positif. Et la contamination est partie de là. Mais également, il y a aussi les autres pays frontaliers, puisque le Niger fait partie des derniers pays qui ont eu à enregistrer des cas, alors que tous les pays frontaliers, déjà à l'époque, ont eu à enregistrer des cas. Et c'est ce qui a favorisé la contamination. Dieu merci avec les précautions qu'on a prises, avec les précautions qu'on a imposées, même au niveau des de, de frontières, cela a permis de réduire de façon significative. Il y a eu également eh, le monitorage régulier, le monitorage régulier au cours desquels eh, des réunions de comité eh, sont tenues, puisque au même titre que mon collègue de, 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 de Rwanda, on a mis un dispositif au niveau des huit régions du Niger. Et c'est même le même dispositif qui a été mis au niveau des 72 districts sanitaires que compte le Niger. Et même au niveau des CS, il y a eu des formations en cascade des agents de santé par rapport à la détection de cas, à la définition de cas, par rapport à la prise en charge de cas, mais surtout par rapport aux procédures de confinement. Puisque, vous savez, nous avons beaucoup de frontières, par exemple, avec le Mali, avec la Libye, avec l'Algérie, où il y a des réfugiés. Durant le, le, la première phase, la, la première apparition de ce maladie, nous avons eu à faire face à des milliers de réfugiés qui reviennent au Niger ou qui traversent le Niger pour regagner leur pays. Il va falloir prendre en compte et cet aspect, confiner ces réfugiés et les tester avant de le faire continuer pour éviter l'exportation le, le, de cette maladie dans leur région ou bien pour éviter la propagation de cette maladie dans notre, dans notre pays. Thank you so much, Dr. Mainasar. And I think that's something I'd like us to talk about a little bit later on the insecurity in Niger and how that's impacting on your efforts. But we've got a question here from Susan Njanji from uh, AFP in South Africa, and it's posed to you, Dr. Mwedi. It's about the number of healthcare worker infections in Africa, especially in South Africa as the epicenter. And also just on South Africa, the fact that the number of uh, positive cases are starting to decline, and if that's mirrored in any of the other African countries. Dr. Mwedi?
Dr. Mwiti, did you hear those questions posed to you? Okay, I think maybe Dr. Mwiti's video is frozen. Let's see if uh, we can just come back to the next question and then we'll see if we can get Dr. Mwiti back on the line. But perhaps if we can get the country experiences of both Niger and Rwanda very briefly, uh, you know, uh, Rwanda specifically has negligible a number of deaths, Dr. Ngamijia, but in terms of healthcare worker infections, how many do you have? Just very, very briefly, please, Dr. Ngamijia. Thank you. Um, we have a very few number of uh, health personnel who were infected with uh, COVID-19. I think there are less than 10 uh, because we we deployed all PPP uh, measures and uh, different measures were taken to avoid that uh, health personnel being uh, contaminated with this disease. Uh, we also uh, we are we use also uh, robots to, uh, to to reduce contact of health personnel with uh, with patients. Those robots are helping us to collect some uh, information, uh, temperature, and and other information in treatment uh, centers. And uh, so basically we, we don't have ish, big issue really of health personnel affected by COVID-19 so far. Thank you so much, Dr. Ngamijia. So we've got another question here from Ibrahim Yebo. Yero. So I'd like to ask Dr. Michelle Yao to answer this question. Uh, and the question is about how the WHO predicted catastrophe in Africa, but obviously that's not happening, given that Dr. Mutu says so far we only account for 5% of the infections. But what explanation does the WHO give for the earlier prediction? And just talk a little bit more about the resurgence of the pandemic around the world, please. What do you foresee for Africa? This is a question. Dr. Bushal, yeah? Uh, thank you very much. Um, in fact, the predictions are based uh, on uh, different uh, scenarios. So the scenario used is um, a, a wide community uh, transmission with uh, also the response capacity that we had at the beginning of this uh, outbreak that uh, was uh, a bit worry for us to uh, that the system could be easily overwhelmed and the disease could be, uh, spread uh, faster. So this was uh, an element taken into account for this prediction. But of course, uh, um, uh, African countries uh, took uh, uh, confinement measures uh, earlier, uh, closing school, uh, as well as also limitation of movement all this uh, reduced uh, the, the spread. So scenario did not happen, but uh, uh, is still uh, uh, not out of uh, context in many countries. If measures have not uh, taken, we can see when these uh, uh, confinement measures were is uh, an increase that we observe uh, in many countries. At least these measures help to build some capacity. Uh, we had uh, quite an increase in uh, the treatment capacity as well as in the laboratory capacity. So our call was a kind of alert of something that could happen if uh, countries are not mobilized and, uh, and not taking the, the right uh, action. So we are pleased to see that uh, it did not happen, but it's not over yet. And uh, it's why um, some of the uh, measures, preventive measures need to be reinforced uh, is to what we notice in many countries that uh, people are no more using uh, masks or are not observing uh, physical distancing. Uh, at the same time, uh, countries should uh, continue working. Uh, decentralizing is critical. Uh, in fact, anticipating to avoid uh, a worse scenario. Over to you. Thank you, Dr. Yao. We do have Dr. Mwiti back on the line with us. Dr. Mwiti, there was a question for you earlier on from Suzanne Nijanji from AFP in South Africa. It's about healthcare workers, the number of infections in Africa, and that is uh, 
Africa as gen in general, but also South Africa as the epicenter. And Susan also wants to know about the daily infections, seeing that they're going down in South Africa, we've seen a decline in recent days, she says, does that mean that this is likely to be mirrored in other countries as well, Dr. Moody? Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. We are having sometimes connection problems here in Brazzaville. Um, so we've, we've uh, found a way of getting some information from countries about the number of healthcare workers that are infected. And we've had so far feedback from 41 out of our 47 countries in the region and uh, indicating that about 35,000 healthcare workers are infected. So South Africa clearly has the majority of healthcare workers who are infected at 24,000, a quite significant proportion of, of, these, uh, of these healthcare workers who are infected. And indeed, we have started to see a decline in the daily number of cases in South Africa. I heard the Minister of Health, uh, Minister Zuelim Kiza, saying a couple of days ago that yes, this is something that's starting, but we need to observe it for a little bit longer before we say firmly that this is a trend. There are num a number of other countries that are seeing a similar decrease to the, a similar degree, about 20% <clears throat> fewer cases uh, the last week than had been the week before. And these include countries like Nigeria, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, um, the Republic of Congo, where we are, uh, Mauritania, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Central African Republic, and then several Southern African countries, Botswana, um, and some West African countries like Liberia and uh, Benin. So we do have countries where, um, despite the fact that the governments uh, did an, a release, a relaxation of the measures, there was an in, initial increase in cases in several of these cases of these countries. Now we're starting to see a, a decline. I think what the, the take home is that we need to monitor this and just assure ourselves that this decline continues, that it is sustained. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mwedi. This next question um, is for Dr. Ngami J. It's from, let me read it. It's from Ivan Mugisha from the East African newspaper. And basically it's speaking about how Rwanda is seeing the number of cases decline to almost 10. And, he wants to know what are the prospects then of the reopening, not only of the economy, but also other aspects of social life, school, et cetera, et cetera. Dr. Ngamiji. Thank you. Uh, the, the, the cases are, are not decreasing so much as we wish. Uh, we, I think for the last two days, it, 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 it's really good, but uh, uh, for the last week and before that, we had uh, a certain number of cases, around 20, 30 cases by day. It's only the last two days where we have a few cases. Uh, we hope this, this trend, uh, if, if this could continue, that would be okay. So, uh, and it is in that perspective that uh, different measures were taken to resume different activities, uh, including churches reopening, uh, and different business uh, reopening as well, including uh, the opening of uh, air border, I mean, the airport of Kigali. Uh, so far, school are not yet opened. We do still watching the situation at the end of this month to see what will happen. Uh, so we, I mean, decisions are taken depending the trend of, of the incidents. And uh, uh, for sure, if everything continues to go well like we wish, additional decision will be taken, but so far, uh, we, 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 are, we, we stick on those decisions that were taken. Uh, the last one was the opening of the airport of Kigali. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndamije. We've got a question here saying that with countries like the US pumping millions of dollars towards manufacturing COVID-19 vaccines, it's clear that Africa not only needs to carry out its own efficacy and effectiveness study, but align itself for the country or companies that will see the continent also get the vaccine on time. So the WHO has spoken about this. If I could just also perhaps bring in Dr. Manasara to talk about this, we'll come back to you, Dr. Mwedi. But 
just what are the challenges? I know testing challenges were mentioned earlier on. How are you overcoming this? How are you capitalizing, optimizing your resources, Dr. Uh, Sarah? Uh, merci, uh, effectivement, nous avons des défis et dans uh, les principaux tournes autour à uh, du déni de la maladie, surtout des fausses informations qui ont circulé sur les différents réseaux sociaux par rapport à, à cette maladie. Il y a un autre grand défi, la réouverture des frontières. Nous venons le 1er août d'ouvrir nos différentes frontières, surtout aériennes, au niveau de la capitale à Niamey, à Agadez et à Zender. Il va falloir mobiliser beaucoup de moyens parce que il y a des conditions qui ont été fixées pour, par exemple, l'arrivée de, 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 d'un passager au Niger. Il doit présenter un test valide d'au moins 72 heures. Et si et, il n'a pas de test, il doit payer pour à, assurer, pour que le test lui soit assuré. Mais si le test est valide, Et il continue et vraiment son chemin et on donne des conseils d'autoconfinement. Si c'est quelqu'un qui doit quitter le Niger et vers l'extérieur, là également, il doit présenter un test PCR valide d'au moins 72 heures pour éviter l'exportation de ce virus vers l'extérieur. Et il y a un autre défi, c'est par rapport à l'insuffisance des respects des mesures de barrière. Là, la, la sensibilisation continue, on est en train d'intensifier Et la sensibilisation à tous les niveaux parce que, comme je l'ai dit, il va falloir apprendre à vivre avec cette maladie. Donc, les mesures barrières s'imposent à tous aujourd'hui à partir du moment où les frontières aériennes sont en train d'être réouvertes dans tous les pays du monde. Donc, les mesures barrières s'imposent. Et il y a la difficulté de, 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 de contrôle des points d'entrée Parce que quand vous prenez nos pays africains, on a ici en Afrique, je dis de façon particulière ici au Niger, nous avons au moins 15 points d'entrée et terrestres, même si la voie terrestre n'est pas ouverte, mais quand même, il y a des gens qui cherchent tous les jours à faufiler. Il y a également, à l'occasion de la saison pluvieuse, les gens qui cherchent à regagner le pays par voie terrestre, tous ces gens, il faut essayer de, de, de les confiner, il faut les tester avant de les laisser continuer, en tout cas au niveau des villages. Tout ça, c'est un défi aujourd'hui qui demande beaucoup de moyens et avec l'appui des partenaires, en particulier l'OIM, qui nous aide à reprendre, à prendre en charge certains migrants, certains retournés, et pour faire en sorte que ces gens soient testés, soient pris en charge, soient confinés, et qu'après le confinement, on puisse les tester, s'ils sont négatifs, ils continuent leur chemin. Hein. Résumé, c'est les principaux défis auxquels aujourd'hui on est confronté. L'autre grand défi, c'est, <coughs> et c'est le, 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 la, la vaccination. La vaccination, même hier, à l'occasion eh, d'un échange par visioconférence qu'on a eu avec l'alliance Gavi, cette question a été posée. On pense que d'ici 2021, si le COVAX serait disponible, et que ce COVAX soit disponible à tous nos pays africains. Là également, c'est un grand défi. Il va falloir une implication très forte des, des, des partenaires qui accompagnent nos États dans le cadre de la disponibilisation des vaccins dans nos différents espaces communautaires. Merci. Thank you very much. Uh... Minister, and that question was, uh, of course, uh, from Elizabeth Merab of the Nation in Niger. So let's move on to this next question from Rhoda Adiambo from BBC Focus on Africa. So she's talking about malaria parasites in Rwanda becoming resistant to artemisinin. And if I could come to you, Dr. Gamiji, to please answer this question. Are you experiencing this? And have you done any research on what is the cause of any such resistance? Thank you. Um, In 2018, 2019, we did a clinical trial. uh, And uh, we came to realize that uh, in one site, uh, Massacre Health Center, uh, we had uh, parasites, some parasites, 
19 parasite, I mean 19 patient with parasites presenting gene mutation uh, against uh, uh, artemisia. So uh, it was 19 uh, some, uh, patients out of uh, 257 uh, total patients that were uh, under that clinical trial. So, uh, but uh, in terms of efficacy of the drug through that clinical trial, we do still have 95% of efficacy in terms of treatment rates. So uh, we believe that uh, the, the mutation is probably due to uh, uh, natural selection or natural, natural let's say, selection of, or, for the, the parasite to survive due to the huge pressure of uh, different measures are in place to contain or to, to contain this uh, malaria. Uh, because we did even assessment with uh, uh, other gene, other parasite in, 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 in South Asia, in Mekong. These two type of parasite are different. So it's not imported, uh, 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 imported uh, parasite. It's definitely uh, antigen uh, mechanism from the parasite to try to survive due to the pressure uh, with different measures in place, including treatment prevention for malaria that we have in, in the country. So uh, we are still watching the situation. We increase the, the, the surveillance and we hope that uh, we should be sharing information with uh, other countries and probably get possibility of other countries also to monitor the situation because Probably we discovered it, but other country might have also those kind of, uh, of situation uh, just because the system is not yet there to, to detect uh, mutation of this gene against Arte, uh, of, of parasite against uh, Artemisia. Thank you very much, Dr. Ngamiji. Dr. Mweti, this next question is from Hudson Kutisa from the New Times in Rwanda. And it's basically talking about what he perceives as a lack of enthusiasm by Africans to be involved in vaccine trials. He asked whether if you foresee this as a problem and how else can you encourage them to buy into these vaccine trials? Is this what you're observing, Dr. Mwit? Um, well, yes, what, what we observe so far is that we have only one African country, South Africa, which is already actively engaged in a vaccine trial. We knew that several other countries were in the pipeline. I know that Mali and a couple of others were considering this and the work was being done to review how they could get involved in, in vaccine trials. As WHO, we strongly encourage uh, the, the member states to be engaged in these trials so that we have the opportunity to see how these tools, the vaccines uh, work in, in African populations. We know, of course, in order to do that, you need volunteers, you need people to come forward and want to be subjects in the trial. And we are very concerned as well about the um, emerging, if you like, negative sentiments among African populations in some cases about participating in trials and vaccine trials in general, because in the early part of the pandemic, there were some discussions implying that African people were to be used as guinea pigs for the development of vaccines. And then most probably Africans because of cost issues would not even be able to benefit after the vaccines had been developed, would not be able to afford to vaccines, access to these vaccines. So this is part of a kind of infodemic as we call it, false information that is uh, around. And we want very much to dispel these negative rumors. There are very strict guidelines under which these trials get, uh, get conducted and populations and countries that have been involved in the trials have the right to have access to these tools. These are the principles that we're very much promoting as WHO and as well as some of our partners at the international level. So we can only encourage, continue to encourage countries and very much the population to be interested in, in being part of discovering these tools because it will be to our benefit. Thank you, Dr. Mwiti. Let's just get some final words from our panelists now. Dr. Ngamije, let me 
come to you to talk about the possible challenges that Rwanda may face. You've done very well in obviously uh, being proactive from the beginning, but does that mean that the low numbers that we're seeing will continue? Do you fear a surge? As the question was asked earlier on, and how would you manage that? Just for your final words in about a minute, please. Thank you. I, I, I think challenges we are we are facing today is that uh, in the region for us it appears that uh, there are still a lot to do to harmonize and synchronize intervention in the region. We are still facing uh, cross-border transmission, high risk of cross-border transmission with uh, mm -hmm. trucks drivers who are who are who are serving in the region. This is one. Number two, uh, with as we open Kigali Airport, we are already starting to receive uh, passengers, some of them coming with uh, rapid test results. Uh, uh, and while clearly we said we are just accepting only PCR tests, uh, so it gives us uh, additional burden for keeping them, testing them until we have their results negative. But as they travel, they, are, they will be with crew who are Rwandese, especially those coming with Rwandair from different countries. So this is a challenge. It's a, it's a challenge for, you know, resuming economy, but also preventing uh, mm. a new cluster from people traveling with uh, different aircraft. Uh, this, these are big challenges that we are, we, 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 we are facing today. Uh, the, the other one is availability of, of, of all kits, especially as we use different platforms for testing COVID. Sometimes you have some platform without uh, available kits on the market, although we want to buy, but uh, we, we might spend like a month, two months waiting the arrival of those, of those kits. So basically these are big challenges that we are facing uh, for now. <coughs> Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ndamija. Dr. Mainasara, just to hear from Niger, you mentioned earlier on, I know you also have challenges of malaria, malnutrition, but there's the insecurity that you're seeing in the Southeast and Southwest. How do you think that will impact on your COVID-19 positive incidence rates and how are you going to manage that? Et l'impact de tous ces facteurs, l'insécurité, la malnutrition et autres facteurs et qui ont un coût sur le budget de, de l'État parce que la prise en charge de la COVID sous-tend avoir des moyens suffisants et pour faire face à, et à, à tout le mécanisme de la prise en charge, à la mise en œuvre du plan de, de riposte. Le gouvernement, en tout cas, est en train de prendre des dispositions d'ores et déjà à l'occasion de la table ronde de mobilisation de, 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 de ressources. Et pratiquement tous les partenaires qui se sont annoncés aujourd'hui sont en train de concrétiser leur uh, appui envers le Niger. Et également, les autres partenaires uh, techniques, et durant pratiquement tout le mois, nous avons eu à réceptionner et tout ce qui est entrant, qui, qui, qui va de médicaments, de consommables, des moyens de protection, des moyens de détection, les tests rapides, les tests PCR, en tout cas, nous sommes en train de les assembler pour faire face, en tout cas, à la réouverture de ces frontières aériennes. Mais également, eh, l'autre défi, c'est le suivi électronique, euh, eh, de, de, le suivi électronique, euh, pour faciliter le suivi de contact, pour faciliter l'autoconfinement. Parce que à partir du moment où on a ouvert les frontières aériennes et on a pris la décision d'autoconfiner, il faut qu'on fasse un suivi rapproché de tous les gens qui reviennent pour que au moindre doute, au moindre symptôme, qu'on puisse tester la personne, qu'on puisse au besoin prendre en charge euh, la, la personne. Et l'autre... Euh, euh, défi auquel euh, on doit faire face, c'est la mutualisation euh, des efforts de l'espace CDAO. Parce que, comme vous le savez, il y a beaucoup de nos pays de, de, de l'espace CDAO, au nombre des 15, qui ont été confrontés aux mêmes réalités de gestion 
par rapport à la mise en œuvre de ces mesures. Lors de la 21e Assemblée générale des ministres de, de la Santé de la CDAO qu'on a tenue avant-hier par vision conférence, des résolutions très fortes ont été prises pour mutualiser les efforts, pour faire en sorte que les ouvertures de ces aéroports soient synchronisées pour que le test PCR soit identique au niveau de notre espace pour éviter l'exportation ou l'importation de cette maladie dans notre espace. <coughs> merci, merci. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Mainasa. <coughs> Dr. Michaud Yao, let me ask you this question very briefly. The search teams uh, Dr. Muti spoke about having arrived in South Africa, is, this, is there a hope perhaps that they will help inform what <coughs> else you do on the African continent? Will you learn more from the search team in South Africa on how to handle what's happening in other countries? You are welcome to answer this question in French. Euh, bon, le, le déploiement en Afrique du Sud, c'est un, un appui complémentaire par rapport à, à l'appui que l'OMS apporte depuis le début par la présence de son bureau. Et le, les, ces gens de mission, on apprend toujours. Euh, cela euh, nous permet euh, d'identifier un peu qu'est-ce qu'on qu peut euh, mieux faire pour accompagner les pays dans divers domaines. Le, le, la directrice régionale a mentionné les aspects d'une analyse fine pour la décision de santé publique, mais aussi l'accompagnement dans la formation. Comment est-ce qu'on peut partir de là en ayant laissé sur place une capacité beaucoup mieux formée pour la suite de l'épidémie, mais aussi pour le futur. Donc, ce genre de déploiement nous permet de comprendre davantage la dynamique de l'épidémie, de partager les bonnes expériences, mais aussi de corriger notre approche et notre compréhension dans cette épidémie. Merci. Thank you, Dr. Yao. Dr. Mwiti, let's end with you. The question was raised earlier on about the battle for resources. You mentioned the issue of the shortage of testing kits, but I think a lot of um, developing countries' concerns is the fact that they don't have the financial muscles that the developed countries do, that when they ev eventually is a vaccine that will lag far behind. And I think that also goes in tandem with uh, a question about you know, the projections, we are at the million mark. Does that mean that because of this, perhaps we'll see a, a, an exponential rise in cases? Just your final words on that, Dr. Mood. Um Yes, I, I think first of all, to the, um, to the projections, you know, we, we had uh, based our projections on a, a starting point of um, community spread, widespread community spread happening. So because of the early imposition of these very severe measures, that did not actually happen. So I, I think the course of the epidemic of the pandemic in Africa has been quite different from what we had predicted has been much less. It's difficult at the moment to say when it's going to peak. We think it's going to be here at a kind of slow burn, if you like, of the type that we are seeing in many countries. We're very encouraged to see the start of a reduction in some countries, even if there are some countries where, uh, the, the, I think about 10 countries where there is a, an increase, but not exponential. So we think that the situation will continue to need a lot of effort. And we are very much then looking forward to the availability of a vaccine uh, at some point, hopefully next year. And here to, to answer that second question, um, we are of course working in, with w, in WHO, with other multilateral partners, with some bilateral member states, African and, uh, and uh, Western and other, and, and globally, in fact, member states, to put in place a mechanism, a platform uh, coordinated by Gavi, where uh, all countries will be able to equitably have access to vaccine supplies once some vaccines become confirmed as being efficacious and safe. We also observe, of course, that some countries, some uh, upper income countries are 
paying hundreds of millions of dollars to secure supplies of vaccine in advance. And we would like to hope that there will be a balanced approach to doing this with the same countries, because they've, some of them have been involved in some of these maltrata mechanisms, really working with the, at the global level on a strong drive for, for, uh, for equity in having access to, to, to these vaccines. The African Union with the Africa CDC as the operational arm has also mobilized African countries, mobilized uh, financiers of uh, access to vaccine to them, then ourselves as the African continent do our part to make sure that we are engaging in these processes of uh, putting money as, uh, up front in order to make sure that Africa doesn't get left behind. This is an issue that I think need merits close, close following up. It merits strong advocacy at the global level, at every level for, if you like, global solidarity. I think it really does merit global solidarity for those who are able to pay in advance to be aware as well that as long as we have countries whose populations are vulnerable, and as long as we continue to be such an interconnected world, then this will continue to be a problem for even those countries that manage to vaccinate many of their populations. And we've observed in some of those settings that there is a high degree of vaccine denial and some surveys are showing that significant proportions of the people say they will not accept the vaccine even if it's, it's not available. So it's a very much interconnected problem. And I hope that it can be addressed in that way among member states. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mwit, and I certainly do agree that it's something that needs teasing out a bit more. There was a question earlier on about whether 15% of countries' budgets are enough to fight this pandemic. So we will, I'm sure, expand on that at another time. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Matsidi Sumweti, WHO Regional Director for Africa, who was joined by Dr. Michelle Yao, who's the Emergency Operations Manager in Niamey. Thank you very much to the Honorable Dr. Edi Iliaso Mainasara. And uh, in Rwanda, the Honorable Dr. Daniel Ngamejia, the Minister of Health Colleagues, thank you so much for joining us. And I do encourage you to please make use of the Q&A function to send your questions in early. Unfortunately, we can't deal with them all, but we'll keep on persevering. Thank you very much to all of you.